You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Amir Siraj. Amir studies astrophysics at Harvard University and is interested broadly in theoretical astrophysics. He is a Goldwater Scholar and U.S. Presidential Scholar. He is co-president of Harvard Students for the Exploration and Development of Space and former senior U.S. editor of the Harvard Political Review. His research advisor is Professor Abraham Loeb. The Vera Rubin Observatory in the LSST is going to be capable of looking for these things, but it's also going to look for interstellar objects. And that's a big thing right now with Oumuamua and the relatively boring counterpart Borisov. We're going to see a lot of interstellar objects. Now, you've also been involved with thinking about panspermia and interstellar objects interacting with Earth, interstellar meteors. Can you uh, give us an overview of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, interstellar objects are really exciting because they bring sort of astronomy into a totally unfamiliar and uh, and different realm because in the sense that our best bet up until Oumuamua came along for studying other planetary systems, for answering these big questions of how special are we? What are other solar systems' chances at habitability? What are the architectures of other solar systems? Do other planets have similar chemistry to the Earth and, and or even to the uh, giant planets? A lot of these major questions in planetary science had to be limited in method by telescopes in terms of you know studying exoplanets either with radial velocity or with the transit method or inspecting for signs of various chemical compounds um, inspecting the debris disks around other stars from a great distance and using the sort of whatever electromagnetic measurements we can get so the fact that we could get a physical sample from another planetary system is just baffling. At least it was to me, because it would take hundreds of thousands of years to travel to a nearby star with current rocket technology to get such a sample. It's quite fortunate for for us scientists that uh, nature has already done the work for us. And nature has not been too boring either. You know, the first one we saw, Oumuamua, uh, the first one we recognized, had these wildly inconceivable properties. And even more fascinating is that it was different from the second confirmed object, uh, Borisov, which looks like exactly what any astronomer might guess an interstellar object might look like. You know, something that resembles the long period comet from the Oort cloud, since that's the most distant region of the solar system and presumably of other planetary systems, and therefore it's the, the easiest thing to free. But, you know, there's, there's an incredible wealth of information that interstellar objects uh, can bring to us about other planetary systems. So, and I, and I think the field's gonna explode over the next uh, few years, um, But in addition to what we can learn from interstellar objects and from long period comets, they're they're close cousins, they might actually be contributing to dynamics of planetary systems and potentially to astrobiology in another way, which is related to the idea of panspermia. So panspermia is this speculative idea that potentially life could be transferred or even prebiotic material could be distributed either amongst planets or or even between planetary systems by rocks, essentially, microbes or prebiotic material hitchhiking throughout the galaxy. And 
you know, this is a really interesting idea, and, and there's certainly evidence for a great deal of exchange of material, for example, between the Earth and Mars. And so this poses major implications for the potential discovery of life or fossils on Mars at some point. If we were to discover evidence of biology on Mars, I think it would be nearly impossible to say whether it was actually a second genesis or whether it's just some distant cousin of ours because of the <laughs> incredible amounts of transfer that we that we know has taken place and we know there's actually evidence of meteorites from mars that have not been heated above around 100 degrees celsius so it's definitely within the realm of possibility within the solar system there's a greater question as to whether it's possible outside of the solar system and so that's one of you know one of my interests which is seeing what the likelihood is of interstellar objects uh, serving as the vehicles for transfer not just of information uh, from other planetary systems as we've been so lucky with studying Umumu and Borisov but potentially even chemical compounds chemistry and and potentially biology and so you know it's a very interesting possibility and there would be two ways to do it one would be if there was an impact of a asteroid or comet interstellar asteroid or comet onto a planet it, it actually could be an impact of anything and 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 this impact would send some debris soaring out above the escape velocity of the planet and potentially above the escape velocity of the planetary system and that's one way to distribute debris but another one that i thought of was the idea that perhaps almost like skimming foam <laughs> off the top of a cappuccino you could skim the top of an atmosphere for example of the earth because we know there are many many comets and there are, have certainly been interstellar objects in the past, just looking at this from a statistical point of view, that graze the atmosphere. And that way, there is life in the atmosphere for sure. We don't know whether the microbes in the atmosphere would be able to survive a trip through space. We know those exist on Earth, but frankly, not, not enough study has been done about the biology of microbes in the atmosphere. But it's certainly within the realm of possibility, which is not what I expected going into it, because, you know, these these interstellar objects or long period comets could essentially skim through the atmosphere, pick up microbes, and also, by coming so close to the Earth, gain a gravitational slingshot and be sent out and perhaps um, down the line be captured by another planetary system. So it's it's certainly a very interesting idea. It is very much in, in the early stages of, of study, but I guess in addition to affording us with great deal of information, interstellar objects potentially have been playing an active role in exchanging material between planetary systems. This idea of life traversing interstellar space opens up a possibility, doesn't it? Because the galaxy is far older than the solar system and has been able to materially support life for a long time. So life here might have originated in another star system. Do you think it could be possible that we might, 10,000 years from now, as we, we ply the stars and move across the galaxy, we find that all life at a microbial level is related? Is that actually possible in this scenario? Yeah, I, I think it's it's absolutely uh, within the realm of possibility because we know that material is exchanged between systems. We didn't know this for sure until Oumuamua, but now we know it for sure. And actually, the number density of objects implied by Oumuamua was much, much higher, and implied by Borisov was you know, far higher than previous estimates. So it's clear that stars eject huge amounts of material and you know one of the things i've been working on is figuring out what the size distribution of that and what what the implications are of that but also how we can increase our sample size you know looking at 
at, at different um, beacons that can alert us to the existence of interstellar objects so we can build out our understanding of this at a population level. But what it comes down to is there, e even with the error bounds on Umumu and Borisov, we know that there's a, a huge population, basically a sea of interstellar objects um, in the galaxy. And I think, and, and there's certainly, you know, evidence of, as I mentioned, material exchange between Mars and the Earth. And so, yes, I this is absolutely a, a possible way to spread life uh, within the galaxy. And that's why I think it, it uh, deserves more study. Related to this is the idea of supernovae, accelerating particles to subrelativistic speeds, and then them hitting places like the moon and being detectable as tracks. Tell us about that paper. Yeah, this was really fun to work on because, you know, this is, you know, kind of a similar theme to interstellar objects or traditional interstellar objects which is the idea of studying something, you know, some astrophysical phenomenon or system in a new way. And so interstellar objects have allowed us to study planetary systems in a new way. And looking into the idea of supernovae and the debris that they produce actually led to this finding that we could potentially learn more about supernovae, and in particular, the local history of supernovae, by looking at the moon. And, you know, one of the reasons I love uh, doing work related to the moon is because it's a very honest record keeper. The moon, for the past four billion years, because of its lack of an atmosphere, because of its lack of tectonic activity, you know, in part because of its lack of... Um, humans uh <laughs> it has it has really preserved everything that has happened to it and so that that gives us a really wonderful and rich ground for scientific inquiry and so the question that i was pursuing was are some supernovae particles some because supernovae are extremely energetic events, and of course they accelerate uh, large amounts of mass to very high speeds, is it possible that we would get, you know, some really, really dangerous, quite frankly, dust uh, particles at maybe 1% of the speed of light, 10% of the speed of light, certainly faster than, than anything has been accelerated to on Earth, anything of that mass. Is it possible that these have hit the moon in the past. And then the other question, which is, would it be feasible for us to study them if they did hit the moon, like either in rocks or in regolith? And, and the answer to both these questions, surprisingly, was probably. And so that, that was really interesting because, you know, if we're able to find these tracks and the reason that they would be, tra you can think of a typical crater as being as roughly as wide as it is deep to order of magnitude but that's because you know these are at speeds that are not too different from the sound speed in the material maybe an order of magnitude or or too larger than the sound speed of of the material but once you get to these sub relativistic and relativistic speeds these uh these particles would actually bore deep holes because of the fact that the information <laughs> that the particle has struck the material would not be carried fast enough in the wave that would propagate sideways. And so you would actually get these long, skinny tracks, and um, these could actually be potentially observable in, in lunar materials, and this would allow us to constrain the, the history of nearby supernovae, and, and that could be very exciting. Could you make a techno signature out of that? In other words, could you say, say you were an alien civilization and you, you deduce that people are going to be looking for tracks on their moon or celestial bodies in their star system. Could you take something really weird like technetium or something like that that you really don't see much in nature, plutonium or 
well, that'd probably be too unstable, but something like that. Accelerate it to sub-relativistic speeds and make tracks that can't really be produced by nature. Absolutely. Um, that's a great point because, you know, if, you, if we think about what as a society are we currently working towards in terms of sending beyond the solar system, of course, we have the two Voyager probes, but Breakthrough Starshot is sort of the major project that is looking at, you know, sending sending probes outside of the solar system at considerable speeds, a fraction of the speed of light. And the best approach and the approach um, that Breakthrough Starshot is taking is to accelerate these uh, spacecraft using radiation pressure. And radiation pressure, you know, can accelerate you know, these probes, but as only as long as they are very light. And this brings into I guess the realm of possibility, the fact that if, if other civilizations exist, they could have sent uh, similar probes. And if you send a very tiny probe at a fraction of the speed of light, that would be pretty similar to a uh, supernova dust grain. And as you pointed out, if it made a track on the moon or hit the Earth's atmosphere, these, these would be very distinct signatures and spectroscopy in both cases would be able to tell us whether the chemical composition is natural or potentially artificial. Now, what about panspermic inter interstellar life? Now, could you encode information in a self-replicating cell, so to speak, and have it curate that information as DNA somehow and send that over interstellar distances as a techno signature? Yes, I mean, that would certainly take a, a far more advanced civilization than ours. And it, the chances for that might be uh, might be hurt by the fact that we're not doing a great job taking care of the Earth or taking care of each other. Uh, and that might, that might be bad news for the lifetime of intelligent civilizations. But if intelligent civilizations live long enough to reach such a level of sophistication, absolutely. And and if we're not looking, uh, we won't find we won't find anything. So I, I think it's it's really important to be searching, of course, for biosignatures, and I think that's you know quite well established now. But um, yeah, to be putting more investment and also more research into techno signatures because there's no way we would recognize something unless we're looking for it. Must look in order to find. Amir, we are out of time and it's been an absolute pleasure and I look forward to your next paper. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What?